from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I am here to introduce a remarkable phenomenon in our profession. While most journalists are in a state of near perpetual panic about our collective future, John Meacham is in a state of thoughtful reflection on the past and what it might tell us about the present. While many journalists struggle to find the right phrase or complete their next story, John churns out columns, letters, and books. He's even a fabulous television personality. Compounding our badly suppressed sense of journalistic envy, he's also the quintessential Southern gentleman, thoughtful, eloquent, and wry. John was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and was raised in part by his grandfather, Judge Ellis Meacham, a writer. John went to the University of the South in Suwannee, where he and his family still keep a home. He joined Newsweek, a sister publication of the Washington Post, in 1995, and he rapidly ascended. He became national editor that year and became managing editor, the number two spot, in 1998 at the age of 29. Three years ago, he was named the magazine's editor. There are two words I associate with Newsweek under John, energy and relevance. There is an urgency and dynamism to the magazine that pulls you into every issue. It's well written, and it's recently been redesigned to place a greater emphasis on the journalism that distinguishes it. That is all John. John has written three books, all historical works, Franklin and Winston, an intimate por portrait of an epic friendship, which chronicled the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill, American Gospel, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation, which describes the spiritual underpinnings of this country, and most recently, American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House, a biography of Andrew Jackson, which won this year's Pulitzer Prize for biography. The Pulitzer Board described the book as, quote, an unflinching portrait of a not always admirable Democrat, but a pivotal, pre but a pivotal president written with agile prose that brings the Jackson saga to life. Please join me in welcoming a journalistic polymath and a role model, a hugely accomplished author, and a terrific editor, John Meacham. Thank you. Thanks to Marcus, who is the editor of what we think of as the Newsweek of Washington, DC. So thank you. Uh, very, very generous. I have two quick observations. Uh, you're here for a while because of the rain, so uh, I hope you all are very interested in Jacksonian America. And secondly, three people since I got here have asked me, have said, Mr. Grisham, would you sign this? <laughs> I said, you know, he's taller and richer. <laughs> and I have little hope of achieving either at this juncture. That's a true story. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's thrilling to be with people who care so much about what, what we care about. Uh, Marcus and I are lucky to work for the Washington Post Company, which is a formidable uh, force, we think, still in the life of the nation and of the world. Philip Graham, the founder of the Modern Newsweek and the late publisher of the Post, used to say that journalism should be the first rough draft of history. Once, when I was a very young Newsweek writer, we got something wrong in our Periscope section one week, and I was in Evan Thomas's office, who was then the Washington bureau chief, when Mrs. Graham called because a senator had called her about the mistake, which she was not thrilled about. And you could sort of hear her voice through the phone as Evan said in his defense, well, but ma'am, it's, it's just supposed to be the first rough draft of history. <laughs> to which I heard her, the voice come through, but does it have to be so goddamn rough? <laughs> so we struggle uh, and uh, try to do what we can. I want to talk about Andrew Jackson, always a uh, vivid topic given, given the man himself. We are in a city surrounded by monuments to great presidents. Washington Monument is here, Jefferson, Lincoln. For Jackson, there's the statue in Lafayette Park. And that's appropriate, I think, because he can keep an eye very close in on what his successors are doing. He would like that. 
One of the ways to think about Jackson, think about any president really, is what did their successors make of them? And so when I started looking into that, you realize that Lincoln, who was no Jacksonian Democrat, to say the least, he was a Henry Clay man, uh, even though Jackson had given him a very important job. Uh, in May of 1833, Jackson made Lincoln the postmaster of New Salem, Illinois. And his, uh, his gratitude for that enormous post was not, was not vast, unfortunately. But when Lincoln came in January of 1861 to write his first inaugural, he sent for Jackson. He called for four documents. Lincoln had adjourned to his, the second floor of his brother-in-law's store in Springfield. He asked for a copy of the Constitution, a copy of Webster's second reply to Hayne, the Clay speech on the Compromise of 1850, and Andrew Jackson's nullification proclamation of the 10th of December, 1832. Now, when you hear nullification proclamation, I want you to try to control your blood pressure because it's pretty glamorous to talk about. It is a hugely important document with the unfortunate title of the Nullification Proclamation. But it is where Jackson made a thunderous case for union against states' rights, against nullification, against John C. Calhoun. Jackson said his only two regrets in public life were that he had not shot Calhoun and hung Clay. So some things never change. Uh, the critical thing about that crisis was we were a young union. We were not, we had not had the decade upon decade upon decade to form what Lincoln would call the mystic chords of memory. And Jackson was an interesting champion of union given that he was basically, in his own phrase, a Jeffersonian Republican of the old school. What was it about him that made him such a champion of the idea of union despite everything else. I think it had to do with how he was born and how he was raised. Jackson was orphaned at 14. He never knew his daddy. His father had died before he was born. His mother and his brothers died in the revolution. He thought of America as one great family. That was his phrase. His family's blood, in many senses, had consecrated the Union, and he could not envision a world in which that sacrifice would have gone to waste and to naught. I want to talk for a second about his father, because presidents of the United States, interestingly, tend to either have a very strong father in the picture or no father at all. If you are raising normal children, give it up. They will never be president. Um, that's my excuse. <laughs> great, great childhood. Um, the, if you run through the history of it, you think about it, strong father, Adams, Roosevelt, uh, Bush, John McCain, nominee. If you think about no father at all, Ford, Clinton, Obama. I asked President Obama when he was Senator Obama about this, about this idea that why was it that fatherless sons tended to do so well in political life? And he said that he had always thought that men were always trying to either live up to their father's expectations or make up for their father's mistakes. And he had tried to do both in his life. I think that's true of Jackson. He was a dependent from a very early age. He had to be raised by relatives, by kith and kin, who weren't all that thrilled to have uh, another mouth to feed and another person to raise. Andrew Jackson was what we would call in a later era a troubled teen. Uh, he tended to slobber when he got furious. His temper was already being honed. He was a handful, and he felt always that he was somehow not in control. And I think that exacerbated his, his feelings and his personality, his hunger to be in charge. His mother said a very interesting thing to him early on, suggested that he become a minister for the cause of God and of the country. I think it's probably best that didn't happen. Uh, militant Christianity would have had no greater champion, come to, come to think of it. But 
the critical thing was I think that put a seed in his mind that he could be the person who was in charge, the person in control, the person ordained. Ordained means he who sets things apart. He says this is important and it's important because I'm saying so. He grew up w driven by an ambition to be the central figure, to have authority among men, to shape the world, bend the world as he saw fit. And I'm convinced that as he grew older, the union replaced the immediate family. He, in his mind, was the head of that family. And that was one of the major psychological reasons that he was such a ferocious champion of union. I want to read you a, one paragraph from the nullification speech that when you think that it was written in 1832, written so rapidly, Jackson was using the pen, the papers were falling off his desk and what is now the Lincoln bedroom was his office. They were falling off the desk, he was writing so rapidly, and having the pages picked up and taken to Decatur House, where Edward Livingston was doing some editing, but it was coming out of, out of his pen. This is what Jackson said to the people of South Carolina. A quick word about South Carolina. Okay, don't need to do it, excellent. I'm a Tennessee, and we think of South Carolina as Tennessee without the hardback books. Um, I just alienated an entire state. Just kidding. Some of my best friends are South Carolinians. I know a lot of them from, I went to, as you heard from Marcus, I attended the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. For those of you who may not know it, it's a combination of Brideshead Revisited and Deliverance. <laughs> Very particular kind of culture. But South Carolina has always been trouble for the Union. No yelling, please. Um, Here is what Jackson said to them in 1832. Contemplate the condition of that country of which you still form an important part. Consider its government uniting in one bond of common interest and general protection so many different states, giving to all their inhabitants the proud title of American citizen, protecting their commerce, securing their literature and their arts, facilitating their intercommunication, 1832, remember, defending their frontiers and making their name respected in the remotest corners of the earth. Consider the extent of its territory, its increasing and happy population, its advance in arts which render life agreeable, and the sciences which elevate the mind. See education spreading the lights of religion, morality, and general information into every cottage in this wide extent of our territories and states. Behold it as the asylum where the wretched and the oppressed find a refuge and support. Look on this picture of happiness and honor and say, we too are citizens of America. It was a powerful and, again, thunderous statement coming from Jackson, particularly since Jackson's reputation was not simply as a, to say the least, a man of words. He was the quintessential man of action. He threatened to field an army and walk, march into South Carolina. He would lead it himself. He threatened to hang the first nullifier he could get his hands on. He, again, subtle, subtle guy. Uh, but in point of fact, he was subtle. While he was making these grand statements, he was absolutely handling the legislative and diplomatic situation with great skill, quietly behind the scenes. It was his administration that ultimately resolved the crisis without violence. He would sit up late in the night in the White House, writing letters to his ally on the ground in South Carolina, insisting, don't make the first move. Don't provoke them. Make them be in the wrong. Once during the bank war, a, a delegation came in looking for relief, and Jackson exploded, spit and spewed and knocked things down, and said, I, this is not the place to come. The delegation scurried out, and as soon as the door shut, Jackson returned to normal and said, 
didn't I manage them well? <laughs> he understood the mask of command and understood what it took to lead men. The thing about Jackson's presidency that drew me to it is how modern it feels. It is absolutely true that there are features of the presidency as we understand it now that can be traced to Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and John Quincy Adams, but the idea of a democratic lowercase d leader with a covenant with his supporters in constant communication with them, arguing that as president he is the, as he put it, the only directly elected representative of the American people is really the beginning of the presidency as we recognize it now. Jackson, you know, it used to be said of FDR that FDR's philosophy of the presidency was himself in it. Uh, that's actually true of a lot of them, I think. It's certainly true for Jackson. I want to talk for a second about the strong presidents who explicitly credited Jackson with this view of the presidency. TR said explicitly, I modeled my presidency after the Jackson-Lincoln School. FDR had what you might call a man crush on Jackson. He was uh, virtually obsessed with him. He had on Pennsylvania Avenue for his inauguration in 1937, FDR had the inaugural stand built as a replica of the Hermitage, Jackson's house in Nashville, Tennessee. He b saw himself, FDR did, as the embodiment of Jackson. As Jackson had fought the bank and entrenched interests, he, FDR, was putting the New Deal together and fighting the malefactors of great wealth, to use that phrase. He very much wanted Jackson and Jefferson to together be the patrons of the Democratic Party. When Truman was growing up as a politician in Missouri, he was as well obsessed with Jackson. He was to, in charge of doing a statue there in, in Missouri for uh, the local county. And actually, Truman drove to the Hermitage to measure Jackson's uniforms to make sure all of the measurements were exactly right. He had a bronze of Jackson in the Oval Office and I think summed up Jackson's appeal on the positive side as well as anybody ever did, which Truman tended to do, when he said, Jackson looked after the little guy who had no pull, and that's what a president is supposed to do. So he was a champion of the little guy. He was a champion of a powerful presidency. He saw himself as their defender. He was the creator I believe, of populism as we continue to understand it. One more little bit from his canon. This is from the bank veto message of 1832, another glamorous title, I know. Uh, this was such a powerful document that Nicholas Biddle, his opponent in the bank war, actually paid to have the message printed up and distributed, misreading the politics so profoundly that he sent Jackson's message out on his own dime or on the bank's dime. The, this is the moral equivalent of the Republican National Committee in 2008 having the audacity of hope printed and sent around to the country. <laughs> There's that level of insight. Uh, but here's what Jackson said. This is how he defined what government should be. It is to be regretted, Jackson said, that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven and the fruits of superior industry, economy, and virtue, every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, then the humble members of society the farmers, mechanics, and laborers who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves have a right to complain of this injustice to their government. That continues to be the populist urtext. Jackson believed 
that the state, because it was formed ultimately of the people, the will of the people, the desires of the people, could be, could be and had to be a instrument of virtue and for good. He was, let us not forget, arguably one of the cruelest men to ever be president. He was an unrepentant slave owner. He was an active opponent of abolition, not simply a passive figure. He was the architect of the Trail of Tears and Indian removal, one of the most important acts of legislation of the 19th century, which is almost completely forgotten, is the Indian Removal Act that passed in May of 1830. He was one of the worst figures if you were on the other side, if you were in his way. He was merciless. One of the things you have to do if you make your living the way I make mine, and you're not John Grisham, um, <laughs> so for the other 306 million of us, is you have to look back and decide what to do with retrospective moral judgment. Should we condemn blindly or completely when there's a reason for that? Or do we have to put ourselves back in that time to recover the temper and spirit, prejudices and passions of that era? I am very much in the latter camp. Arthur Schlesinger used to say that self-righteousness in retrospect is easy, also cheap. And I think the best thing we can do with the sins and omissions and crimes in some cases, the outrages of people like Jackson, of people like Lincoln, of people like our founding fathers, is to find in those outrages the knowledge, the strength, the willingness to look around in our own time at the injustices that surround us. One generation's good is the next generation's clear evil. And so before throwing rocks at the past, I think we have to be cognizant of the moral failings and issues of our era for we would want the same level of consideration when the future judges us now, later. I want to leave you with this. In his second, Jackson's second inaugural, which is not a, as famous perhaps as Lincoln's, maybe just a little difference there, he said the following. He was involved in the standoff with South Carolina, secession was in the air, the war with the bank was going on, he was trying to create an America that would be fairer, juster for those parties he was interested in, in that, for whom that should happen, and wanted to be very clear about the issues at stake. The time at which I stand before you is full of interest. The eyes of all nations are fixed on our republic. The event of the existing crisis will be decisive in the opinion of mankind of the practicability of our federal system of government. Great is the stake placed in our hands. Great is the responsibility which must rest upon the people of the United States. Let us realize the importance of the attitude in which we stand before the world. Let us exercise forbearance and firmness. Let us extricate our country from the dangers which surround it and learn wisdom from the lessons they inculcate. Those were wise words then, and I think wise words now. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Hi. you. Hi, John. And this? I'm this looking, where am I? There you are. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. I, think I was going to wear that hat. This is it's for the rain, but yeah. uh, I'm inside. I think at the very least he had the finest set of hair any president had. He did. It, 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 if John Kerry had won, there would be a race. But. There'd be a race. <laughs> and John Kennedy wasn't bad either. What I would like you to comment on, if it makes any sense, is that it seems like Jackson was the first president who didn't really ever think of himself as a British subject. 
His family was tortured by the British. He fought the British in 1812. And did that give him a sense of being an, a true American yep. and that sense of us versus them? And what's Mika really like strike that? Uh, ab yes, absolutely. We are in a... Uh, with Jackson, we have the first self-made man who was ever president. He was the first non-planter from Virginia or uh, Adams from Massachusetts. When he was 14, he was briefly a British prisoner of war during the Revolution, during that vicious fighting down south. And the British, a British officer said, polish my boots. He refused, and the British officer hit him over the head with a saber, leaving a gash the length and width of a man's finger in his head. Was there till the day he died. He very much saw the British as the the enemy. Uh, he was pretty good on the diplomacy with them ultimately when he was president. But he saw himself as an American. He saw himself as a Republican, lowercase R. And he was the first president to see himself also as a Democrat, lowercase D. In your research, um, what did you find uh, Native Americans of that time? saying and writing about Jackson? That's a great question. What did Native Americans of that time say and write? One of the things you have to do when you're making these judgments in retrospect is judge the level of thinking on the side, on the side of reform in, in those years themselves. One of the things I loved doing in this book was learning more about Jeremiah Everts, a name I don't know how familiar to you. He was the William Lloyd Garrison of Indian removal. I think the reason we don't know more about Everts and we do about Garrison is Garrison won and Everts lost. There were a number of essays, a number of uh, uh, protest documents produced in order to make the moral case against removal. Indians found, Native Americans found him to be a great father uppercase G, uppercase F, which was the custom of the time, who represented a government that tended to break its promises. So it was not a, but they, it was, it's such a complicated question in some ways, and then it's quite simple. We wanted the land in the eastern United States. This is, this is exactly where I grew up, in southeastern Tennessee and Georgia. And the, the death knell was sounded when they found gold on Cherokee land in northeast Georgia. And that was that. So there, there's no sugarcoating this or explaining it away. There, well, there's explaining it, there's no excusing it. One more. One more. Can I ask? Sir. So uh, Jackson instinctively may have cared about the little guy, but can you point to any progressive legislation and laws that he would have gotten passed? I know it was a little bit early for much of that from the presidency, but things that would have actually benefited as opposed to sort of tearing down things like the bank. Well, he believed very much that a balanced budget paying off the national debt was ultimately the rising tide that would lift all boats. The war against the bank was motivated by political concerns, but had benefits for working people broadly, farmers, laborers, and mechanics, as he put it, because what he was really wanted to do was destroy any rival economic and power centers that might be able, that might be able to profit more at the expense of the, the public wheel than, than was then was right. So that was, that was the main thing. And also the, I, I, I go back to, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, Jackson saved the Union at a critical time. There was nothing foreordained about the American experiment. We were always in danger. From the Whiskey Rebellion, through secession, through 1861, 1865 really we were at risk. And Jackson set the stage for Lincoln. Without Jackson, there would have been no Lincoln, I firmly believe. And one of the things that I think we have to do when we look back is try to find out, try to discover what is it that can help us pushing forward. And with Jackson, I think it was a concern for, as Harry Truman said, the little guy. And that concern, as he, 
President Truman said is what a president's supposed to do. So thanks very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.